Well, another week has gone by. Here I am. I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast here on J More Living. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. From time to time, I do check my computer to see if there are any questions that you have for my guests. Today's guest, a big hello for Suzanne Buttermilk, who for the past 20 years has been the voice of Baltimore. It's a restaurant scene through Baltimore Magazine, the Baltimore Sun, Back to Baltimore Magazine, and freelancing, and she's now teaching writing over at Towson University. Hi, Suzanne. What's on your plate today? Hi, Dara. Well, I already taught one class this morning, um, so that got me going. The two, it's so weird teaching Zoom classes. The students show up in their you know, pajamas sometimes. <laughs> and I have one student who's a mom and she's got two kids who are also doing virtual learning. So she's trying to concentrate on class and then also help her children during the class. So it's busy time for everybody. Well, Alicia, who was the writer for the New York News who um, was doing a, a little extracurricular activity while online um, in a Zoom? And we'll see that. Okay, but I'm um, so I put out the promotional materials for the show and I let people know that you're coming on the show. And you put out and you reposted and you said, Well, you know, um, you need to find out how I got started in writing and there's a gun involved. So let's start off with that. How did a gun involve you writing for food writing food writing? Oh my gosh, it's it's, it's an interesting story, I think. Um, I was a news reporter at The Sun at the time, and I was doing occasional food stories, um, but, you know, as a side um, venture for The Sun, but I was covering news. So one day um, I came into work and there had been a triple murder in Parkville and the people had been suffocated with plastic bags. It was pretty horrific. Mm -hmm in the late 90s, mid 90s. And um, my editor sent me, the, uh, one suspect had been arrested. So my um, editor sent me to the neighborhood where the um, suspect lived to talk to neighbors. It's, you know, what reporters do and to, um, you know, to see if anybody was at home at, at the suspect's house. So I got there, it was a hot, sunny August day and just like really quiet in the neighborhood, like no one was around. So I started knocking on doors as reporters do and no one would answer. And, you know, I went to several houses and still no one would answer. Um, this was in Rosedale. And I um, finally went to the suspect's house and knocked on the door and this guy just hung out of the window of the second floor and started screaming at me to get out of the neighborhood, to leave people alone. And he was um, shouting obscenities. He wasn't asking me nicely to leave. He was, you know, pretty um, definite what he thought of me and where I should go. So I thought, okay, this isn't working out well. So I went, to, I went down the street to my car, got in my car and called my editor and as I was calling my editor, I happened to look up and the guy is running down the street. He's, he's bare chested, has jeans on, but he has a gun in his jeans as he's running down and he's threatening me. If I don't leave, he's gonna pull out the gun. And so I'm talking to my editor and I'm going, Mark, I don't think this is working out. <laughs> I'm gonna come back to the office now. And I wasn't that familiar with the streets in Rosedale. So I'm driving around just panic that this guy's going to find me and I finally find my way out get back to the office and took a breath and thought uh, you know maybe it's time to do something else <laughs> you know <laughs> I had little kids it was like I you know it's it's it was an adventure and everybody thought it was a great story but it was one that I didn't really want to live over and over again so you know I just started to write more about food and eventually there was an opening in the um, features department at the Sun for a food editor, and that's when I was able to just transfer full time to food. But that's my government. You have a passion for food. That's beyond <laughs> this. this, this is your passion, and to let people know that um, you took your daughter, who was 2017 Breast Association of the Maryland's uh, Chef of the Year. 
Bridget Bledsoe, who um, is she still ever in Towson, or she, is she working? She's at Towson Tavern now. You know, after working at um, Michelle's for fifteen years, you know, she, she was time for a change, and um, you know, she really loves it at Towson Tavern. She's cooking a lot of her um, breakfast specialties on um, Saturdays and Sundays. But like many other restaurants, um, you know, they're, they're open, but it's just not the same, but they're surviving for now. Well, that's good. Let's, let's talk about your trip. Those who don't know, um, La Varin is a cooking school. What's it, Burgundy? Um, um, and um, the woman who ran it, may she rest in peace, Anne Willen, many, many, um, uh, the people that we know and chefs have gone to La Varenne. Tell, Let's talk about your experience there and what your walk away were. Oh my gosh, it was just just the such a thrill. I mean, it was just the adventure of a lifetime. I had read a book called The Cook and the Gardener by Amanda Hesser, and she had spent time there working um, as a chef uh, for the Ursu chef, and she wrote about her adventures, you know, the gardener, you know, sort of this, you know, old guy she tr couldn't really get close to, to talk to and how they formed a friendship. And, you know, she included recipes and um, it was, it's, she was staying in this, you know, beautiful, beautiful um, home in, uh, it was in Joigny, which is in Burgundy, about 90 miles um, away from Paris. And I thought, wow, I would love to do that one day, you know, just would love to do it. And so finally, I had um, a chance to, you know, do the trip and just, it was great. I was actually working as a food editor in Columbus, Ohio at the time at the Columbus Dispatch. Turned out that the chef that was there at the time was from Columbus. So I was able to turn it into a work story as well as, you know, just working with Ann Willen, who was amazing. A little scary, actually. She's very, um, you know, very formidable. Yeah, formidable. And she was one of Julia Child's best friends. And, um, you know, I could just remember her. I was trying to whip cream and she's just all upset with my technique or rather lack of technique. And, um, you know, she just didn't mince words. You know, we bought chickens and cut the heads off. And, um, but it was just so great. You know, I, I'm just a home cook. I'm not a professional cook. I just enjoy being in the cook kitchen when I can, you know, pretty much, you know, I'm a cookbook person, a recipe person, you know, and then we'll put my own spin on it. But um, yeah, it was great. It's it's not, they're not there anymore, Labyrinth closed, which is, you know, really a shame because I just brought back and still have so many good memories from it. I just, a, a short footnote, um, and I mentioned it when Bridget was on the show with um, David Dopkin, uh, Gourmet Magazine had a write-in to take the Labyrinth classes at the Greenbrier. It was a contest. Oh, yeah. And specifically, I had an oversized postcard, and I was sending it. And my husband says, what's that? And I said, you know, I'm going to, you know, try to win this. He says, well, you better take me. And I won it. And oh. so not to do the battle with all my friends who like to cook, I took him. But, he, you know, he sat in the class, but it was very, very formidable. Mm -hmm. What a great experience. And for you to share that with your daughter that have the same passion, that's, you know, mother and daughter have so many things in common, but that's even better. That's a great bond. Um, let's talk about the book. Uh, last year at this time, the book was released, The Lost Restaurants of Baltimore. There it is. Hold it, hold it up there still. Put it up there. If there, there we go. That's fine. It doesn't go in reverse. The Lost Restaurants of Baltimore that you co-authored with Kit Pollard. You can put it down now. Let me see your put them. There you go. Um, you co-authored with Kit Pollard, and that was it was such a joyful read. And so many restaurants um, that were missed putting in there. But you did a lot of sleuthing, didn't you? Yeah, we did. It was, it was, um, it actually came about because of a story I'd written for Baltimore Magazine. And I had the publisher from um, 
the book called me and asked me if I wanted to write a book called The Lost Restaurants of Baltimore and, you know, pick up where I'd left off with, with my story in the magazine. And once I realized, you know, s s the research it was going to take and how much time I had or, or didn't have, I, that's when I, you know, asked Kit if she would be interested in being my co-author because, you know, I worked with her. I knew she would, you know, get the job done and she was a good writer and, you know, she was as curious about it. Um, restaurants and the chefs as I was. And so it was a great partnership. You know, I, I couldn't have been happier with the two of us working together. And yeah, we, we did a lot of tracking down. You know, when you're writing about restaurants that opened in 1925, and then you're trying to track down people that um, might be related to people who work there and looking for staff, looking for customers. Um, my biggest thrill was finding um, Philip Friedman who was one of the owners of the Chesapeake um, restaurant. And he's in his 90s and he lives in Florida. And, you know, it took me a while. Um, I ended up finding a son first, Don Friedman, who's now in, um, I think, Nevada. And so it took us, I mean, I was doing all this from home, but it took me around the country to, to track down people. And like Harvey Sugarman, you know, he, was another restaurant owner um, who the restaurant had closed. And so, yeah, it was, it was great. It was really, we really had to use our reporting skills to, to work on the book. If there, you know, uh, I enjoyed the book. And like I said, there's so many more. And unfortunately, because of COVID, there's going to be many, many more, unfortunately. I I don't know if you heard they failed to that there was uh, someone who set the fire at Jilly's restaurant. Jilly's and yes. Pike. They found they found the person who oh, uh, burned burnt the place down. So I haven't gotten to it. I just got texts from friends because anything food, and I'm sure they do. Did you see? Did you hear? You know, they want to be the first one to let you know. Um, as I, I'm not quite, to, I'm a sort of writer. I, I've never, you know, I basically just passed English in high school and have always been very um, hesitant about my writing skills. But you, but I still have people because of all I do in food, they go, what's your favorite restaurant? Now, I'm sure you get that question. How do you handle it? Oh, I... I always just joke and say, it's like asking who's your favorite child. You know, It's like, I, um, and, and like a lot of times it depends on the mood. You know, sometimes you're in the mood for comfort food. Sometimes you, um, you know, might have some extra dollars in your wallet. So you might want to splurge a little bit and go to a, a higher priced restaurant. You know, I personally like the smaller, you know, locally owned restaurants um, myself and, there's so many good ones in Baltimore. I mean, and there's so many good chefs. That That's the great part is, is that, um, you know, even we, though we might not be known as a food town compared to like Philadelphia or New York or even DC, you know, we just have so much to offer. You know, I, I'm, you know, I have favorites. How about you? I mean, what, where do you like to go these days? <laughs> sure it is. Okay. And how I address it is I have certain dishes I like at certain restaurants. And you, you find that, you know, that you go here because you love their duck la rage or, or whatever it is. I like the ribs at Wing Wah, which is now carry yeah. out. Um, it used to be um, when really in food and it's a women's culinary group. We go to New York and we go to John George and we go here and there. And I'm much happier with, you know, going to the corner place and grabbing a favorite or, you know, they do great ribs here or they do a great sandwich there. And that's sort of what I enjoy. So it's based on a particular item. Um, in doing reviews, now let's go back 20 years. 20 years, there was no Yelp. <laughs> no. There were no influencers. And people were writing that 20 years ago, you as a reviewer would go in slightly disguised so people wouldn't know that you were going in. In your days of reviewing back then, uh, are there any interesting stories that you can share when 
mean, did you go in as a hidden personality when you did reviews? No, actually, I didn't. I didn't wear disguises, and I was rarely recognized. <laughs> so I guess my um, feelings should be hurt by that. But the people who knew me, you know, they would be people that I, um, you know, would have that that I interviewed were usually the chefs, and they were back in the kitchen, so they they didn't know I was there. Um, one of the funniest, ex or not funny experience, but it was just a coincidence. Elizabeth Large and I would often show up at a restaurant at the same time. And we just look across, Elizabeth Large was the longtime restaurant reviewer for The Sun. And then when I was reviewing for Baltimore Magazine, um, that's when our, our, you know, we would uh, find each other at different restaurants. And, you know, we just nod, kind of nod, not, not really speak to each other. Um, I, mean, I mean, we're friends. It was, it was just done on purpose so that we wouldn't call attention to each other. But, um, you know, it, it, it was so different because you couldn't, th there were no menus online. Um, so you just had a lot of times these big, heavy menu, menus that, um, you know, I would try to um, take the menu. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I would have, you know, a record, I would, you know, take notes. We didn't have any phones where we could take notes or anything. It was like all little paper. So yeah, it's changed a lot. And, um, you know, and of course now everybody wants short form and, um, and that's good, you know, it's good. We're all pressed for time. So, you know, it's, it, reviewing has changed and, um, you know, thankfully we're having more diversity, which is great. And, you know, it's just the, the time had come, the time had come, but, you know, it was, it was fun to do while it lasted, you know, it just, um, I know one time I went to a restaurant, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to embarrass the restaurants, but I, um, I wasn't even reviewing it, but somebody had told the manager that I was there and I guess they thought I was going to be reviewing it. So I'm sitting at the table with a friend of mine and all of a sudden, we had a little bud vase of flowers. All of a sudden, that's taken away, and this big bouquet of flowers is put on the table. And then um, they changed the waitress. So instead of the waitress, I started with there's this other very you know, sharp waitress there. Um, and they brought us a little snack that I noticed no one else was getting. And so I just, you know, it was it was just funny and they wouldn't they didn't recognize me it was only because someone had told them that i was there that um all of a sudden i was getting this attention <laughs> you, know, so. you just told about you and elizabeth Lord, your predecessor cynthia glover and i was out with her and then diane niece at savannah's when savannah oh. just opened and the next table was Elizabeth Large, and they had a they had a bad night with fried oysters. <laughs> Just, I went had had no who was sitting out there, but that's another story. Was there ever a, a review you went in you you had the food and you thought it best not to do the story? Um, yeah, I. I, I the thing I really liked about working for Baltimore Magazine is that, um, I mean, you, you tell the bad, you know, when things aren't right or they seem the food tastes different or off and it's not what it's supposed to be, but they're, they're not out to tear down people or restaurants. And, um, you know, that fits my personality. You know, I'm just, I want to tell people the, the good places to go. So if I did go to some place and it was awful, I didn't write about it. I, I might, I would go back at, at some point. Um, and or go back another time and, and you know before I would write about it to see if it was just consistently bad because they're bad nights you know back in the as you know in the kitchen all sorts of things can happen you know the the mm -hmm. chef cuts himself and is rushed to the hospital the dishwashers don't show up I mean there's all sorts of reasons that the restaurant can get in the weeds well I was curious about that um, in your opinion, what makes a good crab cake? Huh. Um, wow. Well, I'm not going what this crab cake is. I'm staying away from that. But from which one? I, I'm not saying which is the best. Everybody has their favorite. I'm asking you what makes a good crab cake for you. I, I err on the side of simpler is better. <laughs> if you, if you, 
move, go outside of Maryland, as, as most people in our area know, you're, you're not going to find a Maryland crab cake. Uh, they might call it a Maryland style crab cake, but then it's got green peppers in it. And, you know, it's just to me, it, it's just basic, you know, it's crab, it's, um, you know, crushed uh, saltines, um, some mayo, some old bay, you know, and it vary, there's variations on that, of course, but, um, you know, it's just pretty much a cake of crab, <laughs> you know. How daring an eater are you? Is there something that you won't eat? That I, I'll tell you. Okay, what? Go ahead. Well, I'm willing to try, but I was out with some people and I never had sea orchard or uni. And it went in my mouth and it was the first time anything became a moving projectile. So, that's the one thing I want to eat. I at least tried it. I'm curious about you. I, I've I've had um, uni. Yeah, I I don't know what I was thinking at the time either. Um, I I you know I I'm a little squeamish about innards. You know, um, and and that's just me. <laughs> you know, I I I love um, Asian court. You know, their dim sum on weekends is just so great I, i'm and i don't know if they're still able to do that at this point um but it would be so much fun you know when it was bustling and the carts are going around and you're picking stuff out and um you know so tripe i'm a little not crazy about tripe <laughs> you know, i've tried but the interesting thing that i like <laughs> and people go to dim sum with me and let me preface this that my mother was a good jewish cook and there was, there's a term cadet, that sort of whatever it was, that she had chicken feet. I like chicken feet, so when I go to dim sum, they look at me and I'm just no way. <laughs> so, but I've had, gone with people they at least tried and I gave them credit. Um, another thing that my mother would fix is sweetbreads and a white cream sauce on toast points. That's innards, I'm not sure that's something that you would eat. You know, they're okay if prepared correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were doing reviews, did you have a sort of set outline in your mind of, uh, you know, I know that we're looking at decor, we're looking at food, we're looking at service. Uh, what was your mind thought when you're sitting down and you have a guest with you and there's some conversation. I don't know. Tell me, walk us through, you know, you just went to Asian court, you know, give me a review. Well, you're right. And, and, and it's different for each restaurant, except because if it's, you know, um, if you're, if you're paying a lot of money, you probably have some more, some expectations of the kind of service you should get. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many restaurants where the service is, polite and friendly, but these, they're not career servers. They're probably in my class, you know, they're great, great, great right. students, but they're not um, career servers. So I, you know, it, and ambiance is, is huge. Does, does the restaurant live up to um, what it's trying to achieve? If it's quiet or noisy or, you know, I, so, as we went through the stage where everything was sort of industrial, you know, the bare walls, the bare ceilings, the, you know, concrete floors that you just couldn't hear anything. And I think one of the reasons, you know, it's a social experience to go out. It's, it's, the food is important too, but you know, you also want to be able to converse with people and to be able to, um, you know, have a conversation, you're, you're out for the evening and, um, and, and service, you know, I, I, service is, you know, pretty high, you know, it, it, and again, you judge it by, you know, where you are too, as far as, you know, the expectations of, of you know, the career versus the um, job, pickup job kind of thing, you know. Like, the, the, like, like, Charleston, two different things. Right, right, right. right. So, right. yeah. I have two questions. We can talk forever. I have <laughs> two questions uh, that I usually ask. Uh, as I start coming down to the end of the show. Um, what was your ultimate culinary fail? Mine. Um, I, I, 
I have to just give you a little background. I grew up, my mother did not cook. She hated to cook. So my um, sisters and I got in the kitchen early, but we didn't, you know, we didn't really know how to do anything. So um, one of my earliest fails was I tried to make ravioli and one was as big as a dinner plate. <laughs> I'm not sure where I went on. Wrong, but it was it was pretty embarrassing. But I've learned since then. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and I just want to remind people if you've just tuned in, we are here with Suzanne, which is under her uh, beautiful face. And Suzanne is the former food and travel editor for Baltimore Magazine. Uh, editor at the Sun Papers, food reviewer at the Sun Papers, um, freelance writer, many, many different media where she's written and you have seen her works. And her book that she co-authored with Kit Pollard is The Lost Restaurants of Baltimore, which is a great read. You know, read it and you go, oh, there's this one. I mean, there is a, a book, too, that there should be. I'm not sure you and Kit are ready to do it. But there are enough of them that um, there's another book that could be done. And uh, my final question, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Oh, my goodness. Um, wow, you, you asked really good questions, though, Dara. So, you know, Thank you for being such a good interview. I think I want to say that. <laughs> Does Is there anything that you'd like to promote or talk about or um, whatever you want? Whatever I want. Um, well, I, I do want to get back to the book a little bit because, you know, after Kit and I um, just started promoting it, then the pandemic hit and we had, you know, several um, book signings signed up that got canceled. And, you know, I, so I think the book's been forgotten about a little bit and, you know, I see it different places. So I hope people will give it another chance, another try. Um, you know, working on this book is, was fun because we're happy memories. The next book, which might be about all the COVID related closings, that's not gonna be such a happy book to write about. You know, it might take a while to do that. Um, but again, you're right. We could only had space to write 30, about 35 restaurants that were loved and we couldn't get everybody in there. So there could be a book too. Right, I know I had brought up Ajan Lowe's, which was so funky. Right. Did you ever go? I did, yes, yes, yeah. Everybody so knew the way to Irene, and I remember sitting on the steps waiting for somebody to come in to be able to go in the restaurant. I, I can't say the food was all that good, but it was, you know, cute to go. It was fun. It was funky. It was novel. Oh, it was very, very novel for its time. Well, I want to thank you. As I said, we can talk forever. Everybody lost. Restaurants of Baltimore. You can find that very simply on Amazon.com, and that is floated up. Suzanne, there's many other stories. There'll probably be another interview. And, just, you know, the first show that I did for Jay Moore was with Kit and the book. You were busy that day, so I'm glad that we could bring it full circle. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. My regards to Greg. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Next week, uh, our guest is going to be internationally known. Oh, what do I? Uh, cookbook author, but known for baking, Nick Maggieri, who has taught many, many of the chefs, gone worldwide in uh, Switzerland and different in Thailand, and doing different classes. Nick will be uh, the guest next week. I'm thrilled to have him. Uh, I am Dara Bunjan. I am the food enthusiast, and this show will automatically be up on Jay Moore's page uh, right here on Facebook. It'll later today be up on jaymoreliving.com and YouTube. You can reach me at Dara Cooks, D A R A C O O K S, that's my social, and you can email me at food at jaymoreliving.com. We always appreciate when you share the show with people who would love the content. 
I want to remind you to please stay safe, wear your mask, and may your plates always, always be full. Have a great week.